Good afternoon. So my name is Callie, and uh, the, the topic that I'm going to be speaking on today is, it's entitled, Self-Managed Abortion, the Future of Child Sacrifice in America. Let me go ahead and open us up in, in prayer. Our triune God, we come to you today with a sorrowful heart, but one that is full of gratitude. We are so thankful that you would send your son to redeem sinners, to live for us, to die for us, our creator himself, who now sits on the throne and calls us to him. We ask you to, in this time, prepare our hearts to hear these things, that we could grasp them, and that you would give us eyes to see the evil that is out there and a heart full of courage and delight, knowing that you are in control, that this is your world. Help us to not be discouraged by the evil that we see, but rest in you, your goodness, your excellence, and joyfully look around us and see you everywhere. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. Like I said, the, the topic that I'm presenting today is self-managed abortion, the future of child sacrifice in America. So I want to take this time to look at what constitutes self-managed abortion and how the pro-life establishment has been instrumental in its proliferation. I want to explore the future trends that are made possible by pro-life doctrine and efforts. I want to be clear, pro-life legislators and lobbyists, they are going to argue against self-managed abortion. They will talk of its dangers to women, dangers to the economy, how destructive it is to families. They will create schemes to ease the burden on these women and provide tangible assistance programs for them. In Texas this year, they increased their budget to $100 million for these particular welfare programs. What I want to show is that the pro-life establishment's unwillingness to criminalize abortion as homicide and prosecute all principal actors, all co-conspirators, and all accomplices equally under the law is what is driving this recent explosion of incidents of self-managed abortion, and it is setting the trajectory of the future of child sacrifice in our country. What I'm not going to be doing is giving a biblical argument against self-managed abortion. And really, it's the same thing as, as being against all abortions. It's the same argument. What I would like to do is, through the light of nature, show you what is happening currently in our country, what's been going on for the past few years, and the plans that they have set for child sacrifice, so that we understand what's at stake and so that we are equipped with the data to shut the mouth of the fool when we talk to them so that we can stand on biblical principles, call them to repent and share the gospel with them and call our legislators to do their duty to wield the sword of justice without partiality. I will mostly be using data and laws from Texas I'm from Texas, and all of the information is, is really similar to what's going on in Oklahoma. It's close enough where you can extrapolate the information. Apart from being familiar with Texas and its laws, most of what I'm going to be covering when I deal with the events of current history, they've all focused because of Texas and things that have happened in Texas. And this is going to help me expose the highlights of what I'm trying to convey to you. There's this thing called Project Santa. 
and this is the Self-Managed Abortion Needs Assessment Project. It's an interdisciplinary research group out of the University of Austin, or University of Texas at Austin. This project is fielded by a group of medical doctors, PhDs, PhD candidates, and other um, academics. Over the past six years or so, they have emerged as the epicenter of research studies, publications, and policy advisors across the United States in the arena of self-managed abortion nationwide. And this is how they talk about self-managed abortion. Self-managed abortion is any action taken to end a pregnancy outside of the formal health care system. And this includes self-sourcing medications, misoprestone and misoprestol, ingesting herbs and other drugs, and physical methods. Central to what we are talking about is abortion. And they define this as Project Santa, they, they euphemistically talk about this as ending or terminating a pregnancy. But what we are talking about is the unjust killing of a preborn human. They continue their definition to describe which unjust killings of preborn children are being talked about when they say self managed. These are the ones that are conducted outside of the formal health care system. Now, the phrasing of this is very important for the framework that they are operating under, and that is that abortion is health care. Saying that self-managed abortions are conducted outside of the formal health care system is a way to capitalize on the pro-life strategy that is enslaved to Roe versus Wade. This is a strategy that solidifies abortion as health care through its legislation. We all recognize that abortion is the unjust killing of preborn humans and that its practice belongs in the homicide codes. Pro life legislators seeking peace with Roe versus Wade construct their laws accordingly. And they start by crafting exceptions to the criminal homicide code to remain compliant to Roe versus Wade. So in Texas, the homicide code is uh, chapter 19, and 19.6 is where the exceptions to the homicide codes start. And the first one is for the mother, and it says, the homicide codes do not apply to the death of an unborn child if the conduct is committed by the mother of the unborn child. This removes her from all prosecution that is directly rated. This is, removes the mother from all prosecution. And this is not directly related to the health care issue. However, it's going to be important here shortly. It's the second exception to the homicide code and its application to the death of the unborn child that relates us to um, the health care. And it is stated as a lawful medical procedure performed by a physician or other licensed health care provider with the requisite consent if the death of the unborn child is the intended result of the procedure. All of the pro-life pieces of legislation are then put into health care codes and are used to define these lawful medical procedures. So it's, it's the health pro-life legislators right that define the lawful medical procedures that have the intended result of the death of the child. And this is how pro-life Republican legislators establish and sustain abortion as health care. Project Santa is starting from this pro-life maintained framework that abortion is health care. In order to distinguish two distinct paths towards killing your own preborn child. Abortion as health care within the formal health care system defined by and governed by pro-life health care laws and the killings that are not. They go on to break down self-managed abortion into three categories. The first is the self-sourcing of recommended drugs. 
And this is RU486 and misoprestol. The second is ingesting herbs, medicinal plants, and potions. And the third is physical methods. Now I want to look at these in, in reverse order. So physical methods. These methods include things like inserting foreign objects in order to kill and remove the child. Think of the coat hanger trope. It would also include things like punching, kicking, throwing downstairs in order to kill the child and induce a miscarriage. Now, there's been a massive decrease in the prevalence of this category due to the ease of access to procedures brought into the formal health care system along with the corresponding propaganda about the, um, the safety associated with the formal health care system. The second category when we're talking about self-managed abortion is the ingesting of herbs and drugs. Now, abortion-inducing herbs and potions have been used for thousands of years. We have indications of, of current use of primitive methods. However, with the rise of techn technological advances in pharmacology, the ease of access, the affordability, we have seen a large switch from this method to the first method, which is self-sourcing of modern drugs recommended by the formal healthcare system. And those being mifeprestone, which is RU486, either alone or in tandem with misoprestol. And they're, they're generic forms as well. It is this drug series regimen that I'm going to focus on today as it is by far the primary method for self-managed abortion right now. In order to show the effects of the pro-life policies that they've had on the rapid expansion of self-managed abortion by the use of RU486 and to show the projected trends in self-managed abortion, I want to zoom out of the particulars of self-managed abortion for a second and look at the history of this drug so that we can see the ties that it has with the formal healthcare system in order to track the divergent paths that it has taken and that will bring us back into scope as we deal with self-managed abortion. So in 1980, the French pharmaceutical company Roussel Uchalaf successfully synthesized its 38,486 com compound, which is called mifeprestone. This is where they get the, the name RU486. The next year, clinical trials of this early abortion method began in Switzerland, and over the next several years, worldwide trials were undertaken. In September of 1988, France approves RU486 as an early abortion method. But the following month, the board of directors votes to stop its distribution because of anti-abortion protests that were going on. A few days later, the French government stepped in and intervened and forced the company to distribute the drug. In 1989, the FDA under Bush bans the importation of RU486 as an early abortion method. In 1993, the Clinton administration asked the FDA to relook at RU486 as a viable option for abortion. After three years of clinical trials, the FDA advises that RU486 is safe and effective for early abortion method when it is used in tandem with misoprestol. Misoprestol is a drug that is used to induce contractions in the uterus. But what happened with it, there was these cancellations of their contracts for patent use of RU486, and this prevented it from being brought into the United States with the FDA for a couple of years. But finally, in 2000, it was approved and its in official um, introduction came into the United States. Let's take a, a second to look at the timeline for the past 22 years of the growing use of this two pill regimen in the United States. Now, when I talk about these numbers, we need to remember that this data only represents the states that provide recorded abortion. 
So there's no federal mandate to report, nor is there a standard format for abortion providers to report on abortions. There's a number of states that do not report at all on abortions, and there are some states that report on abortions, but they do not report on medical abortions or pill abortions. And as we think about that, remember that the abortion industry, these clinics that either are or are not reporting, we're looking at the reported numbers, these, these numbers are coming from facilities inside of the formal health care system. The first full year of introduction of RU486 and misoprostol series, we saw a reported increase of 1% use to 5% of all reported abortions. By 2005, that was 9.9%. .9 In 2010, it rose to 17.7%. .7 In 2015, it was 24.5% of all reported abortions in the United States were done by this pill regimen. That, that means in 15 years, it took over a quarter of the abortion industry. Within five years after that, it nearly doubles to 43.7%. And we can expect this trend to continue. Don't forget that these are only abortions that are reported, and they're only medical abortions that are reported that come into these figures. And these figures come from facilities inside of the formal healthcare system. Let's take a look at Texas versus the nation as far as the rate changes go. This is slide number nine. I'm not gonna read through it, just take a look at it. Um, it starts out with Texas being already at 24.7% in the nation at 17. But if you notice, something happens in 2014 where Texas drops by over half. From 2010 to 2014, we see Texas surpass that of the nation. What happened in 2013 that caused this massive drop? Texas passed a health care law that restricted protocols of pill distribution, but more impactfully, it was the regulations on facility standards and admitting privileges for doctors. Now this healthcare law was overturned after going through the judicial process, but at the beginning when it was first established, it did shut down over half of the abortion facilities in Texas. But if you look at only the drop of the, the pill abortion rates, it can be really misleading as to what's going on. The pill abortion numbers did drop by about 15,000 every year of those two years. But there was a simultaneous increase in surgical abortions by over 5,000 each year. So th there was a, a drop of you know, somewhere around 8,000 for each of those two years. But we see it affecting more the pill abortion. Larger corporations like Planned Parenthood and other well-funded organizations were able to increase their market share as the smaller facilities found it fiscally impossible to remain in compliance. So they consolidated and expanded their reach. These clinics honed in their formal healthcare system look and ethos as they began to build back better. During those two years, accounts of crossing the border with Mexico to purchase these drugs, we saw with that news reports, articles, and exposés done to bring to light the plight of these women being denied access to kill their children with the ease and safety of the formal health care system. In addition, there was an awareness that was being made to the counterfeit drug distribution problems in Mexico. There have been a couple of documentaries that have been produced to show what was happening at these cross-border child-killing trips, as well as instructions on how to make the journey if needed. And it's in this climate that Project Santa emerges. Its early work focused on the historical data in Northern Ireland and uh, collecting and researching data in Texas. They did this voluntary survey when all of these abortion clinics shut down. And uh, they did this voluntary survey in three different clinics in Texas. 90% of the women 
that were asked to participate in this survey as part of the intake at the abortion clinic, 90% took the survey. And here are some of the findings. 30% of the per, um, participants had prior knowledge of self-managed abortion, that is, killing your child outside of the healthcare system. And of that 30%, 28% said that they had considered doing it. And by then, the, the main method was crossing the border to Mexico to buy these counterfeit drugs. Of the 30 women with prior knowledge, the, um, they talked about self-sourcing the medication from Mexico. A quarter of them talked about getting them on the line. 70% of the women that participated in the survey had no idea, no prior knowledge of what self-managed abortion was, but nearly half of them said that they wanted to learn about it. And it's at this time, in 2016, when Plan C launched its website. And it did so to demedicalize the medical abortion industry. It seeks to provide resources on self-managed abortion and direct its users to various on-the-line pharmacies and abortion pill providers. In their words, they seek to normalize self-managed abortion and change the narrative of this practice as a catalyst to a new era of access to this form of self-care. They rate several self-managed abortion organizations they have nine that they generally deal with that give consultations and write prescriptions and, and send abortion pills to the people going to their websites. And Aid Access is one of them, but they receive the highest rating consistently over the other nine. Part of this is because the pharmacy that they use is recognized and recommended by the World Health Organization. In 2018, Aid Access establishes itself as one of the leading online self-managed abortion information and consultation services directed specifically at the United States. Its founder, Dr. Rebecca Gompartz, modeled this organization after other organizations that she has run for the past decade, 12 years, in other countries that have severely restricted abortion in their countries. From that site, you can request a consultation. And this is merely just filling out a form, how far along you are, your age, and a couple of other questions. And then they send you a prescription, and they recommend this pharmacy. And so the pharmacy in India mails the pill directly to the woman. And they do it at a cheaper price cost about anywhere between $75 and $100. And right now, there are all kinds of scholarships that you can get to get it for free. There have been, and there still are, other places that you can get RU486 or its um, generic form. And the same in issue of influx of low-quality counterfeit drugs is what plagues other of these online services which is why aid, aid Access gets a, a higher rating. Because it prides itself on its reliable access to quality generic drugs where the other ones cannot. And at this point, going to Mexico is cost preventative to a lot of people, so mail-in pharmaceuticals are cheap and can be done from home. I wanna talk real quickly about this distinction that we make between brand name, generic, and counterfeit to help with this discussion. Brand name is the RU486. It's from the company itself. It uses its own manufacturing plants. It costs more, substantially more, because they're paying for the research and development, the, the length of time for the patent to hold, um, the trials and paying off the FDA, and all of that type of stuff so that the FDA regulates them in the way that they want to be regulated. <laughs> then there's another category that, that is what we would consider generic drugs. Um, it, it's the basic, same basic formula, same active ingredients, but it's formulated slightly different. They are a lot cheaper because they're not paying for all of the same things. Um, some pharmacies are more reliable about the generic forms that they have. 
when, when you when we're talking about the generic forms of this, that was a two pill regimen of two drugs. Some of the generics are a seven pill or multi pill, depending on which generic you get. The last category is counterfeit. And this is usually run by various cartels, either in South America or Southeast Asia or India. And with these, you don't have the same type of manufacturing oversight. You're using low, lower quality stuff. They're not using the same formula. Sometimes they're cutting it with like rat poisons and things. So you don't know overall, depending on what kind of pill you're getting, whether it's effective or whether it's dangerous to you. And this is not just for abortion pills, this is for pharmaceuticals across the board. So I want to make those distinctions between brand, generic, and counterfeit. There was a large marketing push to bring awareness to self-managed abortion by many social um, social reproductive justice advocates and activists across the globe at this point in 2018 is when it really started picking up. So Facebook, Instagram, and now TikTok, they all have social media influencers with substantial platforms and channels dedicated to education on self-managed abortion procedures, how to source the material, how to use them, what to look forward to, um, how far along you can take it safely, how to get away with it without getting caught. You can find it all on these social media sites. They pop up and down. Um, a lot of them are private groups. I'm gonna talk a little bit about them later. So the same source, um, the same drugs can be sourced through aid access and other online services at a fraction of the price than you can get from going to the abortion clinic, which is why the abortion industry has pushed so hard against self-managed abortion. They lose money off of it. Well, in 2019, Aid Access received a warning letter from the FDA calling them to immediately cease causing the introduction of these volatile drugs into U.S. commerce. The basis of this letter was that generic drugs were being used to deliver, and those generic versions had not gone through FDA approval. In response, Aid Access Aid Access sues the FDA, and to this day, there has been zero action taken against Aid Action, even though the letter says that failure to correct these violations will result in FDA regulatory action, including seizure injunction without further notice. But they have done absolutely nothing. I'm going to share some of her quotes here in a little bit from the organization and their lawyers. In response to the government-manufactured crisis that we're going through right now with the, the COVIDs, several states ordered a moratorium on elective medical procedures. This brought about the claim of temporary closures of abortion clinics, and this was the case in Texas for about four weeks for a period in 2020. Now, we have eyewitness accounts from being out at the clinic to say that they didn't really close However, we're going to pretend that they did close for their argument. In their coverage throughout legacy media and social media, they talked about all of these closures happening. And they spilt much ink on the legalizing of telemed services within the healthcare system and mail in abortion pills. Because of the spread of the COVIDs. These newscasts and articles also brought national attention to services like Aid Access as a parallel outside of the formal healthcare system infrastructure. So those four weeks of clinic closures for the state mandated ceasing of elective medical procedures, we did see a recognizable dip in abortions that were reported during that time period by about 30 to 35%. Project Santa teamed up with Aid Access to analyze their, their own data over that four-week period across the United States. They looked not only at the increase of web traffic or views of videos or resource inquiries on self-managed abortion, they focused on the consultation requests and prescriptions. This corresponded with massive uptick in the analytics for Google and other search engines for self-managed abortion or do-yourself abortion 
across the board. And what their findings showed was there was a nationwide increase of about 30% for services related to consultation and prescriptions being mailed. That's across the board in that one four-week period. They found that uh, a correlation between the size of the restrictions within a state to how much that state increased in its request for pills. Texas led the way by shooting up 100%. It, it doubled the number of pill requests for consultation and prescriptions, hitting nearly 1,000 during that one-month period. And this study gained national attention in the media, which further spread the news of self-managed abortion and finding out how to kill your own child outside of the formal health care system with aid access. In January of 2021, SCOTUS reviews the telemed and distribution of abortion medication through the formal health care system. And their decision stated that the FDA has the power and authority to make these decisions, not them. So in light of that, the FDA, under the Harris-Biden administration, changes its regulatory practices for pill distribution of RU486 within the formal health care system. You can now, according to the FDA, use telemed services, so you do not have to go to the abortionist. You're using the abortionist, you're paying the abortionist, but you can do it from home on video. You also do not have to go into the abortionist to get the pill so that you can kill the child. They will mail it to you. And this is not an emergency situation because of COVIDs anymore. This is the, the normal protocol for how pill abortion is nationwide. Now, states can regulate how they want to do it, but those are the guidelines. Project Santa, Plan C, and Aid Access, if, when, how, and other reproductive rights advocacy organizations have stated explicitly that their goal is not to move to a telemed and mail-in distribution process, but to move to an over-the-counter with no prescription needed, much like the morning after pill Plan B is currently sold. They, they recognize that this is not a possibility yet, so to ease the, um, the facilitation of that move, they want to expand our understanding, the nation's understanding, bring, raise the, the consciousness of the population to understand what self-managed abortion is, how safe it is, so that they can move to it being sold over the counter. They want to normalize this practice. And we're seeing this is a huge shift in the pro-abortion narrative. So when it comes to arguing pro-life health cares on the prescription and distribution of medical abortion pills, the pro-life lobby and the pro-choice lobby have now taken its opposition's arguments. Sounds really strange, but that is what's happening. One of the pro-abortion arguments against stricter regulations for government-sanctioned baby killing including full bound, uh, bans on this sacrificial practice, used to be that imp this was an imposition on a woman's right to kill her child, and it would necessarily lead to unsafe abortions outside of the formal health care setting. And this would put the lives and, and health of these women at danger. That used to be the pro-abortion argument to these laws. Now, when they're talking about telemed and male distribution for at-home abortion, they cite the World Health Organization's recommendation for this practice. They produce papers showing the efficacy and safety of killing your own child from the safety of your home. While the pro-life advocates now argue the dangers to the health and the life of the poor women that try to kill their own children from the safety of their home outside of the formal health care system. Here's a couple of quotes. This is from the president of Students for Life. Handing out deadly drugs through the mail is a disaster waiting to happen. Risking women's lives to make a political point and quick profit makes no sense. And we sadly anticipate horror stories when inevitably something goes wrong. That's a pro-life lady 
using the old pro-choice argument. Now here's the eight access response. Less than one in 100,000 women who use medical abortion die, making medical abortions safer than childbirth and about as safe as naturally occurring miscarriage. These are prime examples of the the debate that filled this last legislative session in Texas, where a whole slew of pro-life health care laws were passed into law. September 2021, the trigger law, the heartbeat law, both went into effect. And three months later, we had SB4, which is a pro-life health care law dealing with pill abortion. This law gives government sanction to the killing of these preborn children as long as certain requirements are, are met. The state gives official permission to kill your child that is seven weeks post-fertilization and younger as long as the mother that is seeking to kill her child sees the doctor in person to see a sonogram and returns in person to pick up the deadly poison. Central to this debate in the legislator was the health of the murderous mother at the expense of the child that they want to sacrifice. The passage and execution of these pro-life health care laws induced a resurgent tsunami of legacy and social media covering this action that turned into, we want to teach you about self-managed abortion. And it flooded the culture and raised more awareness to telemed and mail-in prescription and self-managed abortion and how safe the practices are and where you can go to get them. Aid Access for One is reporting an increase in web traffic and requests for consultation and prescription on a scale that is unprecedented in in its history, ever since those laws were passed a few months ago. And they attribute their success directly to the pro-life health care laws as they stand in direct defiance of them. They point to the impotence of the state to do anything in criminalizing mothers that seek to kill their own preborn child. Now, Aid Access hasn't um, produced its official numbers, but the rumor is that they have at least doubled, if not tripled, since the pandemic. Here's a couple of quotes from Aid Access, their founder. Where I work from, it's legal to prescribe the medication, and so I will do that. And the pharmacy that I refer to is allowed to mail the medications on a prescription of a doctor to the women. So the new Texas law has no impact on what we do. On another quote, she says, I don't care about six weeks. It's another law that is not based in any scientific evidence, human rights, common sense. I will provide prescriptions for abortion like I've always done. Here's one from the legal counsel of if, when, how. Importing drugs from abroad is against the law in the United States, but the FDA doesn't tend to go after individuals who are bringing in medications into the country for personal use. And this is from the aid access lawyer. All of our drugs are going through. The FDA and the Postal Service weren't stopping any. They weren't arresting women. They weren't doing anything like that. Women still have the option in Texas, just like they do in Idaho and every red state. So for a second, let's assume that the abortion industry in the formal health care system in Texas is mostly compliant with these new health care laws. You guys in Oklahoma report about 5,000 murders a year. Texas does that in a month. We report over 5,000 murders a month. Now, assuming that they, they are being compliant and, and assuming that their numbers are honest, they're, they're reporting about a 50% decrease in reported abortions. So we're looking at somewhere between 2,500 to 3,000 children that are not being reportedly killed in abortion facilities in Texas. One of the things that they're doing is traveling to California, Colorado, New Mexico, and here in Oklahoma. We're estimating about 10 to 15 percent of the Texas women are coming to Oklahoma. That means that your next reported 
series of abortions is going to double. N next year, you guys are going to have at least 10,000 reported abortions because of this. And there are nonprofit organizations that act in support of abortion gen generically, but the abortion industry in particular, and they are subsidizing travel, um, lodging, and the procedures for women to stay in the formal health care systems. These organizations stand for reproductive justice, but they stand with the industry against self-managed abortion. But that's only 10 to 15 percent of the women from Texas. That leaves a whole nother 85%. So what is happening with them? Out-of-state child sacrifice tourism accounts for a substantial number. But self-managed abortion through aid access in the past five months has taken over the lion's share of that 85%. Like I said, we, we don't have, they haven't produced their numbers officially, but the rumor is somewhere between two and three times what it was during the pandemic month period, which was a thousand dead babies through them, through self-managed abortion per month. I wanna make two things clear when, when I'm talking about this though. Since the heartbeat law took effect in Texas, they've stopped producing their reported abortion numbers. We used to get them every quarter and they have not reported since September 1st. The other thing, even though ADAX is, is boasting about increase in traffic, they, they aren't releasing their official numbers. So these are just guesstimations about how much more people are going towards self-managed abortion, but it's still a striking number. And this is only the Texas phenomena, but Aid Access is saying that this is across the board, across the United States, and the increase is relative to how strict the laws are within that given state. So Aid Access and telemed service prescription people, to a lesser degree, these are not the only parallel infrastructure that is outside of the medical community outside of the formal health care system. But they exist and they're being established to facilitate child sacrifice in our country. Aid Access is the most organized, it is the most established, it is the best funded, it is the most recognized and the most promoted. And since the COVIDs and Aid Access, trips to Mexico have gone away. It, it's just not happening. So counterfeit abortion pills has from Mexico specifically has really gone down. There are some other counterfeit problems with India, but most of them are coming from Ada Access and a couple of other places. Organizations and individuals across the United States have begun to talk about and set up new parallel infrastructures in addition to Ada Access in order to support self-managed abortion not only the action, but bring awareness to how we ought to do it so that we can change the perception of the population to normalize it. Some are setting up postal redistribution schemes for pharmacies that will not send to restricted states. You send it to another state that's unrestricted and they have a system set up where they mail it to your state from there. Um, there are doctors in California that are re writing preventive abortion prescriptions, and they're getting people to stockpile these prescriptions. And they're saying on the line on Twitter, out in the open, hey, these things have a five-year shelf life. Collect them now. Set up distribution centers. There's a lot of social media action going with, with outside of aid access. Aid Access is getting all of the legacy media and some social media hype, and, and it, that's the mainstream one. But if you get into post abortive groups on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, TikTok, they're not only telling you how to source the material, where the best places to go, how to do it, what to expect, with videos and all of the, they're private. They are also um, crowdsourcing money to stockpile pills, create distribution centers. You can get on various pages right, right now 
and they're doing pill exchange. Um, all of that is what's happening on the ground. Most of what I've been talking about today has is, is been from a high altitude with reputable organizations like Aid Access some, that the media is willing to use to like help bring awareness to self-managed abortion. But really the damage is happening on the ground with a lot of these groups. And if you would like more information about those things, um, talk to Not a Victim or Imago Day, the two ministries out there. Um, they're actively involved with dealing and seeing this type of thing daily. If you thought the numbers that I'm showing you about aid access are insane, which they are, what's happening with, with these other, outside of the formal health care system, just on social media, by far worse. This is way more damaging than we realize right now. And we're seeing this shift into two distinguishable, but sometimes overlapping pro-life or pro-abortion fronts. There is the establishment in support of the abortion industry inside the formal health care system, and they are pushing for the removal of laws, regulating and governing the state sanctioning of killing your children. They are advocating for and subsidizing child sacrifice tourism coming from more restrictive states. But the second front is leaving the formal health care system that houses the abortion industry. And they are seeking to empower mothers to take more control over the sacrifice of their children. And it is the latter that is gaining the most ground. And that is not to say that the abortion industry inside the formal health care system is not behemoth. It has way more credentials, more funding, more public support, more grounding and functioning institutions and organizations that are currently active, but it is crumbling. The future of abortion in America is self-managed abortion, and that is killing your child outside of the formal health care system. It is self-sourcing these drugs and killing your child at home. And they are influencing the culture to normalize that. It's growing rapidly in acceptance and popularity. The pro-life health care laws that have been implemented over the past four years have hampered the abortion industry inside the formal health care system. But we're seeing a demand for the practice of child sacrifice needing to be met as a result of these laws. So the self-managed abortion system began to rise. The advocates begin to establish parallel infrastructure and use these health care laws in order to promote self-managed abortion, to educate people, to normalize the practice of killing your preborn children outside of the formal health care system. They are effectively changing the perception of the people through social media and legacy media, and they've been bold in their public proclamations and defiance of these health care laws, citing the authorities' inability to charge them as distributors their reluctance to stop the distribution of drugs and the lack of arrest of women that kill their children. It is the unwillingness of the state to prosecute the mother, who is the principal actor in the commission of the unjust killing of the preborn children, that has strengthened their voice, their resolve, and their determination. On December 1st, at the steps of the Supreme Court this year, they were hearing the arguments for the Dobbs case and a group of women from Shout Your Abortion on video all took abortion pills. That video has gone viral, not only in social media, but in legacy media. Last week, maybe I guess it's about 10 days ago now, on live TV, uh, this guy was interviewing a woman about abortion and she took an abortion pill on live TV and the interviewer was shocked. He didn't even know what was going to happen. That's how easy it is to get this and do this. And then she talked about what she was doing, killing her child on live TV. That too went viral. 
These women that kill their children, the advocates that support them, the organizations that establish this parallel infrastructure outside of the formal healthcare system are all emboldened by this one fact. They know that the pro-life establishment, its organizations, its legislators will not criminalize abortion. And they will not prosecute women that unjustly kill their own preborn children. And they are capitalizing on our history of showing partiality to the wicked, justifying the wicked, and condemning the just. They know that self-managed abortion is the future, and they are paving the way using this pro-life mindset and the victories of the pro-life health care laws against the abortion industry and the formal health care system to catapult their success and their takeover of child sacrifice. It's time that we recognize what the future holds. And if we do not repent and seek to apply equal justice, that is where it's going to go. And it's only by the gospel of Jesus Christ and calling our legislators to repent that we have a hope. Without that, without a God who can do anything, there is nothing that's going to stop this. So I thank you. Look into this. Go talk to those two organizations. See what's happening on the ground. Make your legislators aware of the problems that they are causing because of self-managed abortion. And you can ask me any questions. I'll, I'll be around for a little bit. Thank you.